from the studio. I'm in early today. I think I'm going to paint my nails before I get started with um, work because I'm taking some like example videos today and gotta keep them looking nice. Um, but I'm working on a new upcycling series of workshops. Right now Material Girls does a monthly meetup where people kind of bring projects that they're already working on, but I've been wanting to have an offering that's more like a skills based where we learn something together, learn a new skill, try it out. Um, and I've been thinking like upcycling is such a great you know, sustainable option, but also there are so many different like fiber art techniques that could be used to upcycle pieces. So I'm going to do a series of three spring workshops where people bring um, like a piece of clothing that has a stain on it or something that they want to upcycle and we learn some different methods. So the first one is going to be patchwork, which I've already made some examples for. I made this tube top with patches that says Alexa. I'm very excited to wear this. And then this is kind of like fabric collage. So I made a cowgirl boot with like some lace and a bunch of different scraps so i think there are so many options with this this is going to be one of the workshops and we're also going to do a couching and embroidery one which i need to work on making the examples for that um because i don't have them yet but if you don't know couching is like you take strips of fabric or yarn or something and then use thread over them and you kind of like make shapes with the strips of fabric i'll insert some clips that will explain it better but we'll do that and embroidery and then the last one is going to be weaving which this is an example of like the weavings are going to be making you do them on cardboard looms using yarn scraps so another great like sustainable material girl skill to learn because i know we all have yarn scraps and i think that's like a really cute way to use them so that is my current project is getting all those launched i need to make examples and event bright listings and marketing materials and collect and like get ready everything that i would need for you know a few dozen people to make those at the same time to draft your own boxer shorts because I feel like those are a summer staple and the red gingham and I have a matching gingham top to go with as well, of course. So I work in a communal studio, right? And oftentimes when people have leftover materials, they'll just like leave them out. Oh, throwing stuff all over the place, which is super nice. And so I came into a bag that was like, take whatever you need from here. And it has all of these beautiful buttons in it. Look at how cool that is. So I think this would be cool for like to put out at upcycling workshops as well and it's nice that they're all already like portioned out and matching sets but how sweet i love having other arts around to share cool stuff with big sewing day gonna try to get some more scrunchies in as well because i think as i said in like the last vlog i got a bunch of new lace now that i know my scrunchie vibe i'm just gonna be like zooming those out so i'm gonna try to do some of those kind of for fun since they're such an easy little project maybe at the end of the day tomorrow's friday and i'm going to my friend Iwana's little party she does z making craft workshops that are so fun and creative and playful and it's her five year anniversary of doing those so, so i'm very excited to go support her and do that i'll put in some clips because i'm sure the vibes will just be immaculate <laughs> fabric and I knew I wanted to make a matching set. This kind of like peplumy smock is going to be the next sewing pattern in Material Girls. It's going to be self-drafted so I'll give you the information on how to do the measurements to make your main square. There'll be a pattern piece to cut out the neckline and then like a bigger piece for the bottom so you can add a little gathering. There are two ties on either side which is very cute. I love this stuff for summer because you can wear it with like nothing under it or bra under it 
Um, you can wear it as like a swimsuit cover up or you could wear it even in the winter with like a turtleneck underneath more as a vest kind of look. So I think it's super versatile, but the bows, I think just add like so much to it. Okay, so that's the top. And then the bottoms. These are self-drafted boxer shorts. So I feel like boxer shorts have been everywhere and I've wanted to make a matching set, but also just have like a classic red gingham because I think I'll wear it with tons of other shirts as well. With these, I used a pair of shorts that I already had and liked the fit of and kind of just like built off of them to make them, you know, slightly longer, kind of the boxer shape. And I'm going to do a whole separate video on how I did that if you're interested um, in making a pair like this, but they're like pretty high waisted. They're pretty long. I actually didn't mean for them to be this long, but then I put them on and I was like, these are actually like really comfortable. So that's my final look with these, but I think they, um, they took out really cute and I like them together. I feel a little bit like silly and like little cowgirlish, but that's also like something I've not been known to shy away from. So I'm excited to wear this this summer. It's a little cold right now, but I'm kind of getting, you know, the next issue patterns ready before the weather for them is actually here. Now on to the knitting project. Okay, I was so sure that I was gonna have a finished sweater to show this week and I do not, <laughs> um, but I did finish the sleeve. It goes from the bottom up and there are increases every few rows and then it's just gonna seam up the side. And I had to do quite a bit of math with this one because the hearts are in there, right? So I had to figure out, you know, it's gonna take me kind of up until here on the sleeve to do all the increases that I have to do, but I'm going to hit a row of hearts before that I can't increase really during the hearts. So how many stitches will I have and where does that mean I should start the heart pattern? And then once I get up to the full increases, you know, I need to start the hearts at the correct place down here so they would still match up up here. I don't know if this is making sense. It actually didn't make sense in my head for a long time. It took like a few tries mapping it out with a paper and pen to figure it out before I could actually make it, but I've got it now. The pattern, like it gives you enough information, but you definitely have to do a bit on your own. I think it's coming together super cute. This is my first sleeve. And last time I showed you this, so the body of the sweater, and I'll attach the sleeve soon. And I think I said before that I want to redo the neckline so that it is a little bit bigger. Haven't done that yet. Here's my last sleeve. This is as far as I've gotten on it so I'm feeling excited to keep going and to kind of get her done. I'm ready for it to be done now especially because it's getting to be warmer outside and I want at least like a chance to wear it when I've worked so hard all winter on it but that is my progress on the Bidding Kiki heart sweater. books for you today. They're both kind of short so I zoomed through them and thought I'd include both of them in this video. Also because the first one I'm going to talk about I didn't really love and I wanted to have another book that I could recommend that I do find really valuable. First book is called Feminist City by Leslie Kern and I will preface this by saying like there's nothing inherently wrong with the book. I just I would give it like three stars. Like I just don't think it really like does what it was set up to do. So basically Leslie Kern is someone who studied feminist geography for 20 years and based on like the back of the book and the intro to the book this was supposed to be kind of like an overview of the woman's experience in the city and what we can do for our cities to make them more feminist, more inclusive of women. And I was really interested to pick this up because I'm living in a city for the first time in my life. I grew up in suburban Minnesota and if you had um if you had asked 16 year old me I would have been like it's basically the twin cities and it wasn't like it is a very different experience living in a city. And something that immediately captured my interest in like beginning to read the book was that she says you know cities are kind of a double-edged sword for women because in one way they offer a lot more opportunity. You're connected to so many industries and so many opportunities and so many people, so many cultures and experiences. But on the other hand, there are a lot of scary things for women in cities. Safety is a constant issue for women in cities and we're always hearing about that. On top of that, depending on the city that you live in and kind of like the feminist in infrastructure that they have there, it's either like easier or harder to do certain things as women, like raise children, have jobs, commute. I'm super interested in the subject matter. Um, and I will say there were certainly some interesting and valuable bits of information in there. One example that is in the book is she talks about transportation and the daily tasks of a woman. A lot of cities, it's quite easy if they have say a subway system for a man to like walk to the station closest to his house and go to work 
and be at work and then come back to his house. For when that might look quite different, they might have to, you know, go from work, take two subway stops, get off and go to pick up a kid from daycare, then get on a bus and go pick up a second kid from school and then back on the subway to go to where their home is and stop by the grocery store and then walk back to make dinner. That becomes a feminist issue when you think about different ways that cities charge for their transportation. So if you can just get like a daily transport card and do as many stops as you want, that might work pretty well. But if you need to pay for every single time you get on and off the subway, there's also, you know, a feminist issue in thinking that it should be only women who are going to take these multiple stops. But, you know, a truly feminist accessible city would think about the tasks that need to happen and say, you know, to be fully accessible, there might be single mothers who need to do all these things. How do we make transport accessible to them? How do we set up our transport lines? So that more things that women are doing are, you know, within reachable distance. And my main critique is that it was just very, personal narrative -y. and I expected coming from a feminist geography scholar for there to be a lot more like research that she's done within her 20 years and it f felt like 75% of the book was just her saying like specific instances that have happened to her throughout her life which in a way I understand is important and helpful but I think if you're claiming to create something that is like speaking for the general experience of women in the city it needs to also just be backed by more like research and more examples from more kinds of people because something she does throughout the entire book that felt a little like odd to me is that she would say something that happened to her and then list like and since I'm a white woman I had it easier than this 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 and this this person and she would just list a bunch of other identities that would have a different experience than her as a white woman which is important to some extent to acknowledge her privilege and acknowledge that other people are having different experiences, but she never goes on to explain what those different experiences are, why that discrimination exists, like never really gets to the root of the cause or even to talking about what the challenges to other people other than white women in the city are. And she's talking about, and our feminist city needs to be intersectional. It's like, well, you haven't talked about any experience besides yours as a white woman. So that's kind of all I have to say about it. A more interesting note and a book I do want to recommend is Rights Not Charity, Protest Textiles and Disability Activism by either Jill or Gil Crenshaw. But this is a very quick read. I think I read it in like an hour. And it's a zine about different protest textiles that have been used within the disability movement. And I thought it was a great, first of all, just like intro to disability rights, which is something I want to be more informed about. And it's such a succinct book, not only do you see like great examples of using textiles for protest, but it also just explained so many like intersections of craft and disability that I hadn't thought of before. One of the things they talk about is working conditions in textile factories that a lot of people become disabled because they are working in textile factories that have terrible conditions and the way that the unions have gotten involved and that continuing to craft in textiles and even use that to protest and strike against labor organizations that are run by, you know, textile manufacturers is a very interesting way that disabled people are reclaiming kind of textiles and using craft and textiles to, you know, make that point is just very powerful. Another example that they gave was that historically textile crafts have been used in a lot of like treatment programs. So it has a lot of like needle and thread activities, use a lot of fine motor skills. It can be um, used in a lot of therapies for disabled people trying to improve mobility, which is not what all disabled people want. So using you know, textiles as a way to protest against the way that like textiles have been encouraged as, yeah, that kind of productive hobby just adds a whole new radical layer to it. And there are sketches of a lot of different protest textiles inside of it, as well as pictures of the actual banners in the back. I really would recommend this. It's very digestible and has, you know, like different headings, kind of each page is about something different. So I found it like a really helpful guidebook. I know I'll be looking back on it for sure. Rights Not Charity is my book recommendation of the video. Next vlog is going to be an exciting one. I'm running two Material Girls workshops in the same week, one in South London, one in East London. So I'll take you along to those. I have more book recommendations. I hope you'll stick around to check that out. So if you like this video, give it a like, subscribe down below to see more of what I'm making and reading and doing in London, and I'll see you later.